And I want to thank a few people because although I've been the person that has been fortunate enough to put this together, it wouldn't have been possible without the Rob family, who I was fortunate to connect with uh, through Facebook and newspapers.com and a number of webs and weaves that I, I took to try to find them, uh, but in particular, two grandchildren, uh, James Robb, who lives in Delaware, and Linda Thomas, who lives in North Carolina. Two great-grandchildren, Jim Gamble and Ellen Robb, uh, Ellen Robb Gibson, who is with us today. Uh, it's great to have Ellen here. Dr. Robb's great-granddaughter is on the back row with her husband there, and they, they have, she is a TWC alum herself and lives in Alcoa. So she, she didn't have to travel far, but it's really great to have Ellen here today. Also, a couple sources uh, that really made this possible, both of which I think you all are familiar with. Uh, the History of Tennessee Wesleyan College, uh, written by Dr. Leroy Martin in 1957, and then also the, the latter history written by Bill Aikens and Genevieve Wiggins in 2007, as well as a number of other sources. But were it not for those, honestly, it would have been very difficult to do this because they captured uh, a lot of things. And, and the last source I'll mention, because I think it's unique to the Historical Society and something I hope the Society will take an interest in, but we have in the university's archives a scrapbook uh, for Mrs. George F. Lockmiller, and that scrapbook is absolutely filled with outstanding Wesleyan as well as Athens history. So if it hasn't been, it should be scanned. Uh, it, it is truly a spectacular resource. So to look at Dr. Robb, who, who is this influential individual? First of all, I'll mention his parents, which you see here on the screen here. His father, Robert Henry Robb, was born in 1852, died in 1937. He was born in Tyrone County, Ireland. He immigrated to the United States when he was 18 years old, as well as two of his brothers. The brothers did not, did not come to the United States. One went to South Africa and one went to New Zealand, but they wanted to get out of Ireland because of the Great Famine at the time. In 1875, Robert Henry Robb joined the Georgia Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church and served as a circuit rider in the North Georgia mountains. He would go on to serve the Methodist Church for 42 years in a number of different capacities. In his final annual conference with the church in the 1930s, he voted in favor of a plan that many of you all are familiar with that united the Methodist Church at the time but brought together the ME Church, the ME Church South, as well as the Methodist Protestant Church, all into one body as, as the United Methodist Church. Uh, Dr. Robb here was the author of three books, uh, all of which are part of the Emory University archives, as well of, as well as all of his other papers. So he was a significant figure in the Methodist Church, and you can go see those papers in the Emory archives and at their library there in Atlanta. Dr. Robb's mother, Nanny Alton Robb, less is known about her, but we do know that she was a graduate of Grant University here in Athens, uh, which ultimately, I, I would say, is how her son uh, got here and became a graduate himself. Her father was born in Tennessee, so she undoubtedly had some connections to the state, even though he did eventually die in Atlanta. Later on, uh, the younger Dr. Robb, Dr. James L. Robb, would write that his father gave his mother significant credit for his own successes, and that if it were not for her encouragement and well wishes, there's no way that he would have ever been able to do what he did as a circuit rider and all of that. Robert and Nanny are both buried in Westview Cemetery in Atlanta. So to go on to our subject, who I should have mentioned, we have a picture over here of, I'll show you many more, but that's the official university picture that hangs in the, the Robb Gymnasium there, if any of you want to come look at it afterwards. But Dr. Robb, James Lindsay Robb, was born in Atlanta in 1884. We don't know a lot about his younger years, and I, which is a little bit surprising because there is a lot of material that has been written about him, but nothing really his college experience, but I think it's safe to say that he graduated high school in the Atlanta area and then would make his first trek to 
U.S. Grant University, which all of you all that know about Athens history know that the, the predecessor of Tennessee Wesleyan College, or now university, was U.S. Grant University, and he did attend the school and graduated with a two-year degree. He also met his wife, Georgia Boyer, at Tennessee Wesleyan as well. Uh, Georgia Rowena Boyer was born in 1902, well, I'm sorry, he, she met, he met her in 1902, again there at uh, U.S. Grant, and Georgia would later say in an interview with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and the Daily Post-Athenian that she liked him the very first time I saw him. However, it didn't work out the very first time. <laughs> they, they ended up uh, going to a Valentine's party in 1902 at, uh, at Grant at that time, and they played a game where they would have a bunch of paper hearts, they would cut them in half, and whose ever hearts connected is, is the person they were supposed to go out on a date with. So Georgia and um, Dr. Robb's hearts matched, but that didn't work out either. So uh, there, there was no uh, romance at first sight, at least, on Dr. Robb's part, until 1904, when Dr. Robb was serving as a principal at an elementary school in Epworth Seminary, she was also working there. They ended up dating and got engaged in December 1904. They were married in June of 1906. For all of you all that know a lot about the Historical Society, which is many in this room, uh, Georgia Boyer was the sister-in-law of Reba Bayless Boyer. So there's a, a strong local connection there. Reba, of course, was a, a charter member of this organization and arguably has done a significant amount of work for uh, McMinn County history. Dr. Robb left U.S. Grant and, and went to the University of Chattanooga to finish an A.B. degree in 1906. Uh, Northwestern University, he finished an A.M. degree in 1926. He received an honorary doctorate of law degree from Illinois Western University in 1943, and then he was in the very first cohort of honorary doctorates ever given by Tennessee Wesleyan College in 1957, where he received an honorary doctorate of pedagogy. So looking at his early career, after he uh, finished at the University of Chattanooga, he went on to work for the Atlanta News. He was the city hall reporter for a short period of time. After that, he worked as the principal of the Epworth Seminary there, which I mentioned a minute ago, where he ultimately would uh, fall in love with his wife. Then he went to be the principal of the Mount Zion Cemetery, or not cemetery, seminary, I'm sorry. The two, two words uh, sound way too familiar. That's appropriate in the historical society talking about cemeteries. So. Then after that, he took a very interesting turn and went to the Philippines, where he was the government supervisor of schools, and their first two children, which are shown in this picture, were born there. James, their oldest son, and Hester, their daughter, uh, both there. That picture was taken in the Philippines in 1910. After he left the Philippines, he came back to Georgia to be the president of Bowdoin College. Bowden College. I'm not sure, is it Bowdoin or Bowden? Does somebody know? Bowden, Bowden thank you, Craig. It's in uh, West Georgia, really almost due west of Atlanta on the Alabama line. That school eventually closed in 1936 after he left, but he did serve as the president there before he went to Gainesville, Georgia to be a principal. So obviously a lot of his career spent, in, or all of his career spent in education. But he did return to Athens, uh, which begins really uh, the, the meat of the presentation he returned to Athens in 1918. He was hired by the University of Chattanooga president, Fred Hickson, to be the dean of the Athens School. At that time, uh, as, as you all know, the Athens School served as, as what was the predecessor to TWC, which we'll talk about a little bit more. He guided the school as the dean during a difficult period. Uh, right, that was right during the middle of World War I, uh, so there Enrollment was a challenge, finances were always a challenge, uh, but with so many young men away fighting, that was one of the, the bigger uh, issues at that time. 
He did have some successes, though, in building. Uh, many of you all might remember the practice school that was on the campus for a number of years, uh, the education practice school. They, they raised enough money, $3,800 at the time, uh, to build what was a decent-sized building, and then also a new gym, which is not the Rob gym, but it is what is the auditorium today. There was a gym underneath it. They were able to raise $75,000 for that. So that was a significant feat at that time. If, if you think about that, around 1920, $75,000, that's not that's a nice sum today, but that was a whole lot of money at that time. As was uh, widely known at that time and still widely known now, there were significant tensions between the Athens School and the University of Chattanooga that, that had existed for well over 25 years. I find it ironic that I've now worked for both of those institutions, uh, so I hopefully I can bridge that gap a little bit. But uh, UC President uh, Arlo Brown or Arlo Ayers Brown began the process in 1925 to separate the two institutions. He felt like it was very important to do so, so he, he uh, named two distinguished leaders who were Miss Edith Maker Patton and Bishop Wilburn Thurkild to lead a process of separation. They did so, and on June 2nd, 1925, a special committee of the University of Chattanooga Board voted for separation, and Dr. Robb served as the secretary of that board at that time, so he was intricately involved in all of those discussions. The board approved that ultimately on June 9th. Subsequently, on June 26, which this is what I would consider to be TWC's birthday, June 26, 1925, there was a, a Tennessee charter issued for Tennessee Wesleyan College. I'll read these six names just because some of you all very well might know some of them or have heard some of them. The charter was issued to George Lockmiller, Samuel Brown, James Malier, John Fisher, W.B. Townsend, C.N. Woodworth, and Edith Manker Patton. So at that point, uh, June 26, 1925, the institutions were officially separated, ending a long period of tensions. And if you read either of those books I've mentioned, you will be very familiar with those tensions that existed. And there was none other than one guy uh, that made a lot of sense to read the institution. Uh, Dr. Robb became acting president in 1925 and he subsequently was elected a permanent president in 1926. Excuse me. His, his inauguration occurred on October 26, 1926, and in his closing remarks, he wrote, The institution has weathered a many a storm, and now as it embarks upon another voyage, may we not hope that, Despite imperfections and shortcomings in the hands of the Heavenly Father, it may move forward and onward to a glorious destiny. Uh, I read through his whole speech, and admittedly, it's probably not one I would give today, but I would have to think it was probably appropriate for 1926. It's very interesting uh, to read. Uh, at the beginning of his, uh, that really was the beginning of an era. He would end up leading the institution through, like I said, probably one of its most tumultuous periods, not just on campus, but also on the national and world stage, given all that would happen in the next 25 years. He insisted that the institution remain a two-year institution, even though the charter was issued allowing for it to be a four-year institution. It wouldn't, until about 30 years later, become a degree-granting four-year institution. He just felt like that was most important at the time. It's hard to know why he thought that, uh, but he did. Uh, as you might imagine, they immediately had challenges from the very beginning, uh, not just for the reasons I mentioned on the world stage, but also financial challenges from the very beginning. Uh, as far as fundraising, tuition, enrollment, the same thing universities deal with now, ironically, were applicable 100 years ago. And you'll see there, that's a, a very early picture of Dr. Robb right after he was elected uh, president. He did have some great successes, though, during his tenure, and that's what I'll focus on these next few slides, because I will say we could spend all afternoon dissecting Dr. Robb. There is that much information, so it was a little bit difficult honing in on what was worth mentioning, because there is so much to mention. 
Uh, the first being the uh, construction of the Murner Pfeiffer Library, which is still in place today. The cornerstone for that library was raised or was laid in 1941, or excuse me, in 1940 with a completion in 1941. It came as a result of a $100,000 gift from Annie, Mur Annie Murner Pfeiffer. She gave $75,000 to build the building and $25,000 for an endowment. That endowment is still in place today, all these years later. You'll see there at the top left picture, and I'm sorry, it's, it's not of better quality, but that is a, a laying of the cornerstone. Uh, Dr. Robb is, is in this picture. He's, he's this man right here. This is the bishop of the church. This is Mr. Lockmiller right here, who I've mentioned several times, who was the chair of the board. Uh, Judge Hicks, who some of you all probably have heard of, is in that picture as well. And then right below that is another picture of Dr. Robb with uh, Annie Murner Pfeiffer, and even in today's dollars, I would say, or in today's dollars, I can guarantee you she was the largest benefactor ever uh, to the university. Uh, in 1942 dollars, she gave $500,000, so if you uh, time value of money that out, that's a lot of money uh, in, in today's terms, but also in that picture is Governor Prentice Cooper right here, uh, the, the younger fella by Dr. Robb. There, and that's out of the backside of Old College. Also, uh, when uh, Miss Pfeiffer was down looking at construction options for the library, she stayed in the girls' dormitory and quickly realized it was deplorable, so she was going to give money for that too. Uh, so that's what uh, came about the Sarah Murner Lawrence Hall in 1942, named after her sister. She gave another $75,000 gift at that time, and she asked the college to go raise $25,000. The trustees didn't feel like they could successfully raise $25,000, so she gave them the other $25,000. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's uh, I know uh, Vant and Minty would both appreciate that type of donor today. So uh, if, if uh, that, that's the type uh, we want. And then... Probably most notable with Dr. Robb is the James L. Robb Gymnasium. It was constructed for $208,000, which was funded by the Holston Conference, the Pfeiffer Trust as well, and a capital campaign. Dr. Robb insisted that it be named after W.B. Townsend, uh, which many of you all might know who W.B. Townsend is, but he was a significant benefactor of the college but he also gave the first 72,000 acres for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, the, the core of that park was given by uh, Mr. Townsend. The trustees, though, insisted otherwise on the name, which they, they certainly can do, and it was named the Rob Gymnasium in January 1950. Uh, Townsend would ultimately have a building named after him, the same building that's still named after him, uh, Townsend Hall, in 1951. When you try to boil 25 years of accomplishments down into six bullet points, I must admit that's very difficult. But the things that stood out to me uh, during Dr. Robb's tenure certainly were the UC, the University of Chattanooga separation. That had to be very difficult given the dependency that had been in place for about 25 years there. He was able to get the institution quickly accredited. It was uh, accredited by the Southern Association in 1926 which is our same accreditation today. And when you look at our accreditation documents today, they say that 1926 date on them. So that's attributed to Dr. Robb. The enrollment, by the time he exited the institution, had peaked 400, uh, which was over double the institution he had taken over 25 years earlier. And this was admittedly through some very difficult times. The Depression, World War II, which took a lot of uh, again, young men and young women uh, away from the school. He was a excellent fundraiser. I think that can be uh, about guaranteed based on some of the things I've said. Uh, Ellen told me, as did some of her cousins, that he would dress in his very finest suit and go to New York to raise money for the college, which is ultimately how he ended up meeting Miss Pfeiffer, was in New York and in that very fine suit he must have had at the time. So uh, some significant gifts were the W.B. Townsend estate, which was $62,000 at the time, as well as the, the total Pfeiffer estate through the endowment and the like of over $500,000. 
He was a champion of athletics. The, uh, if you look at the board minutes and other documents from the 1930s, the, uh, the board wanted him to get rid of athletics, but he insisted otherwise, kept it moving forward, which I think was probably an extremely wise move. Uh, the TWC teams ended up winning a number of championships, uh, some of which are, are fairly notable. Those of you all that follow athletics of the 30s and 40s, I believe they even made a, a, a little uh, trip to the Peach Bowl and, and some other things. They won the, the Junior College National Championship for football uh, and a lot of other things during that era. And something unique he also started was the faculty pension program. Uh, he, he strongly advocated for higher faculty salaries as well as benefits for faculty and staff. So, so that is notable as well. You'll see there are two pictures of him, one at his desk and one sitting out on the quad area. Dr. Robb was very active in the Athens community. He was a member of the Methodist Church he served as a member of three general conferences, including the one in 1932, 36, and 40. He was part of the Uniting Conference, just like uh, a lot of other Methodists were in 1939. He served on the University Senate from 1932 to 1948, and is president of the National Association of Methodist Colleges and Universities. So he was extremely active in those circles. He also served as both vice president and president of the Tennessee College Association, which at that time was both public and private together. It is not that way today, uh, but that would have been a significant post in 1936. He was president of the South uh, East Athletics Association, the Southern Association of Schools, as well as a unique role he played here in McMinn County. He was the chair of the Citizen Service Corps during World War II. Uh, which, uh, as, as I understand it, was part of a defense organization in Tennessee to inform individuals of, of how to be aware of potential invasions and, and things of that nature. And probably his greatest service in Athens was the Kiwanis Club. He was a charter member of the Athens Kiwanis Club. He was the second president of the club, and he also served as the governor of the Kentucky and Tennessee district. So he played a significant role in that organization. You'll see here one of his latter pictures uh, while at the, the college there. I think this picture is neat. Uh, it's him looking out the doors of what is now Townsend Auditorium. Those same doors are still there and he's standing there on the platform of what would have been the administration building. In June of 1949, he announced his retirement. He wanted to give trustees a one-year notice, which that's not something that's done much anymore, so I, I applaud him for that. And as you might imagine, there were a flood of tributes that came in uh, for Dr. Robb. The announcement was covered widely in uh, area and state newspapers. If you go on newspaper.com, you can find a lot of stories about him in June 1949. President Lloyd of Maryville College wrote to Dr. Robb, you personally have built an inviolable reputation as an educator and a church college leader. So that was just one of many tributes that came in. In uh, January 1950, uh, the Robb Gym was opened and, and appropriately so, the Kiwanis Club of Athens hosted a celebration uh, for him as, as part of his retirement. The club presented him a gold watch for all of his service to the campus and the community. Uh, there were a host of tributes that were led by Paul Walker, who many of you all know, uh, and also the first game against uh, an, uh, another institution was played in Rob Jim against Emory and Henry, and unfortunately, the Bulldogs were defeated. So it was not a great first game, uh, but there have been many wins since then. His last commencement occurred that May where 135 individuals graduated and the commencement speaker was Governor Gordon Browning at the time. And right after that commencement, the College Alumni Association uh, held a, a large dinner that also was widely covered in the newspapers uh, then for Dr. and Mrs. Robb where they presented him a brand new car. So that was a, a good win. Uh, for him after 25 years of service, and I don't mention it in the presentation, uh, but Mrs. Robb, I think, is to be commended, too. Her 
uh, work in the Athens community and the receptions she held and the offices and, and all of the clubs that you all would recognize she was extremely active in. And on his very last day in office, he wrote thank you letters to those that had raised $9,000 for a campaign for a new campus organ that had been led by Ken Higgins, but he personally wanted uh, to uh, write those letters on his very last day in office. He was given the title of President Emeritus by uh, the college trustees at the time and, and may be uh, one of the few presidents to receive that title and was succeeded by Dr. Leroy Martin, uh, somebody that had a lot of ties uh, to Athens. He wasn't born here, but he had spent a considerable amount of time here. Very interesting story and connection to Dr. Martin is the office I left at uh, UTC was the very same office that Dr. Martin had had. Uh, some of his books were still in there, so it's very interesting how things come uh, full circle. And uh, Dr. Robb was one of the first two individuals named a distinguished alumnus by the college as well. So after he retired uh, and drove away in his new car, they drove right to Atlanta. Uh, he, he, uh, and he and Georgia lived in his boyhood home on Hemp Hill Avenue, uh, where he would uh, live, well, they would own right until they passed. He worked part-time at what is now Clark Atlanta, doing friend raising and fundraising for 12 years. And he also uh, spent, uh, he also wrote a book titled Story of Our Tour, England, Scotland, and Ireland, plus some personal experiences. That book is a wealth of knowledge in about 50, well, not 50 pages, maybe 30 pages of, of things. And he, in an article that appeared, the same article I mentioned uh, on the Rob 60th wedding anniversary, uh, he wrote, at no time do I believe I could lay claim to being a scholar but at least I did pass as a successful student and school administrator. So I think he was probably a very humble uh, individual. He made a lot of trips to Athens after he retired, uh, again, based on newspaper and other accounts. But he, was pre he presented to the Athens Kiwanis Club for his last time in 1967, talking about their trip to Europe. Uh, he, was, he was very excited about that. And he also made trips that he wrote about to visit uh, Miss Lucy Wilson, Ray and Otha Hammer, Randy and Lulu St. John, and Miss Reba Boyer. And they visited the G.F. Lockmillers many times at their winter home in Auburndel, Florida. So he was very active in staying engaged with folks in Athens. They were great gardeners in their retirement. Uh, several of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren told me they had the best vegetable and flower garden in downtown Atlanta, which is hard to imagine, uh, but I do think that's very accurate. And they were proud grandparents in their later years, and, and you could tell that by talking to their family. Dr. Rob died in 1971 in Atlanta, and Mrs. Rob died while with her daughter in North Carolina in 1974. They're both buried at Westview Cemetery there in Atlanta where uh, a couple of their children and his parents are buried as well. And you'll see there uh, pictures of their headstones. When you think about Dr. Robb's legacy, I think easily probably his greatest legacy is Tennessee Wesleyan University. Uh, that's why I put the, the picture I did there. Uh, I think without his leadership during that time, the likelihood of Tennessee Wesleyan being here today is probably pretty, pretty sparse, if I had to guess. Uh, the gymnasium is certainly the, the biggest reminder of his legacy uh, that, that's often referred to. So next time you're in there or you drive by, you won't be like me and think it was an athletic figure. It was named after, you'll know who it was named after. And I wanted to mention his children as well. He had uh, four children. Uh, James Boyer Robb, who died in 1966, he attended TWC and served as the business manager at the college for a number of years. His daughter Hester, uh, arguably probably one of the more active uh, citizens of North Carolina during her time, she died in 1983. She was both a TWC alum and an Ohio Wesleyan alum. She was awarded 
the college's Distinguished Alumnus Award in 1978, and she was married to a gentleman you all may have heard of, Coach Rube McRae, who was the football coach of the TWC football team for a number of years and went on to have a very distinguished career as the coach of William & Mary College in North Carolina. They were married at Blakesley Hall on TWC's campus. Um, that The team that I mentioned to you that won the national championship of junior colleges, he was the coach of it in 1938. Uh, Reuben Hester would go on to be uh, almost charter members and founders of the Boys and Girls Club home of North Carolina, and she was extremely active in community and statewide affairs. The library in Lake Waccamaw, North Carolina, is named after them. Uh, his third child, uh, Marion Robb, died in 2005, so he, he lived the longest, which I believe is Ellen's grandfather. Uh, he was also a TWC alumnus, UT grad, and had a PhD from Purdue. He was head of DuPont Stein Lab and director of research for the Naval uh, Plant. He also was given a TWC alumnus, Distinguished Alumnus Award in 1986. And their youngest son, Spencer, died in 1984, or 1994. He was a Duke graduate and a member of the 1938 Rolls Bowl team. Uh, and he retired as the resident agent in charge of the Montgomery, Alabama FBI. He was the lead agent during most of the civil rights movement in Alabama. So you can imagine uh, the role that he played at that time. And he went on to serve in the uh, cabinet of Alabama Governor Albert Brewer. So Dr. Robb's children were all very accomplished and successful in their own right. He has a host of grandchildren and great-grandchildren that, that literally live all around the country. So with that, I will happily close and take any questions.